Hello there, everybody out there on Facebook Live World. It is great to see you, not see you, be with you, whatever. I don't even know how to talk about it. But here we are all together kind of on the interwebs. It's an exciting moment, a lot of fun. We are going to delve into the beauty of the second chapter of the book of Hebrews. Woo! Right? It's exciting. I'm excited. I got to be honest. I am excited. But I'm a nerd. So, you know, what do you, what do you want from me? Uh, I just got to get some stuff put together here. I should have had all this done already. I'm sorry. Anyway, it's great to have you with us. All of you that are that are here and uh, that are watching this now or later or are joining me on Zoom. It is great to be with you. Let's pray, and then we will dive into God's Word. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm seriously, I'm having so much fun in this book. I don't know if anybody else is having any fun, but I am having a great time. Thumbs up if you're having fun in the book of Hebrews. Um, but I am having a great time. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, and I'm excited about uh, this chapter. Uh, I got totally lost in this chapter in a beautiful way uh, uh, as I was studying it. So I hope that the same happens for you. So let's pray. And then we will get, we'll go. So Father, we thank you so much for an absolutely beautiful day, a couple of beautiful days. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for your presence, that you are always with us, that you never leave us, you never forsake us. It doesn't matter uh, where we've been or what we've done or how far we've run, you're always with us. You're always speaking to us. Your love for us never, ever changes. Oh God, that is so good in a world that's so changeable. Lord, I just pray as we open up this book, that your spirit would speak to us, that you would, it, that it'd be a, the right word at the right time for all of us that are do, uh, studying this together. We would hear your voice. We would see the glory of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and King. And we would be filled with awe and with joy in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So, Hebrews chapter 2. Let me, uh, we'll, put, we'll put that on the screen here. Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm going to read it to you. Well, that's not very big. Can you read that? Let's make it bigger. Here, how's that? Okay. For this reason, it says, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, uh, New American Standard Bible, I should say. Uh, just in case you were wondering. All right, so it says, For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. We will stop there. Okay, so those are the first four verses there of uh, the book of Hebrews. Uh, chapter 2. So we're going to... Um, I'm going to read that for the first verse. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. You know, my Bible teachers in in uh, in college always talked about phrases like for this reason or therefore. One of their favorite things to say was, if you see a therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. I know it's stupid, but it sticks in your head. So um, but it, things like for this reason, uh you know, if you just started there, and if you hadn't read and studied chapter one prior to this, then for this reason doesn't make any sense. So you need to go back and you need to look at what was in chapter one, okay? And chapter one was all about 
talking to us about how Jesus was greater than the Torah or the Old Testament law and greater than the angels, that the resurre- the uh, um, that the uh, my brain just shut off that the uh, that <laughs> that the re- the revelation that was given to the people uh, by Jesus was um, was greater than the than that which came through the law and the prophets greater than that which came through any other source prior to that um, the the revelation that was given uh, uh, through Jesus was given by God himself of God himself and so they uh, and and so that's where you know that's obviously better so that's what the last chapter was about so that for that reason because we know that Jesus is that Jesus is greater than the law that Jesus is greater than the angels because that was the second half was was talking about how Jesus isn't just some other heavenly, uh, you know, divine being. Jesus is God Himself, Creator, co-eternal, etc. All the stuff we talked about in in uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, chapter. For that reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. In other words, because this came from Jesus, it's like. If, if, you know, some just guy just walks in off the street and tells you, uh, hey, there's, uh, I don't even know, uh, there's a disease going around and you should probably be careful of it. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, some guy that walks in and just says that to you, hey, uh, or, or an actual medical doctor who has been checking on people and looking at them and and, and, and he says, hey, y'all, there's a really bad disease and you should be protecting yourself from it. Who's, who, you know, who, whose opinion do you weigh more highly? Whose opinion is more important? Who are you going to listen more closely to? Obviously, the doctor. Why? Because he's got expertise and he's got authority because of that expertise. And, and we think the same way about Jesus because Jesus is God himself. So Jesus' word, the word that comes from Jesus, obviously carries a greater weight. And what he says here is so good because it says, so that we do not drift away. So that we do not drift away. I want to talk to you for a minute. This, is, this book is actually going to have a lot to say about the, the possibility of, quote unquote, losing your salvation. And we're going to have a really interesting conversation with that, just not today. But what... I love this phrase, drift away, because that's exactly how it happens. People don't just walk off a cliff and stop being Christians. People don't just walk off a cliff and all of a sudden, oops, I don't love Jesus anymore. That's not how it works. That isn't how this, that's not how this, uh, this thing happens, okay? The way people walk away from Jesus is inch by inch, slowly, they drift away. You know, first they they stop doing uh, they stop doing their devotions, and next they stop going to church every week, and next they lose contact with their friends, and next they move. You know, and little by little, other ideas start drifting in and having a greater purchase in their brain than the truth. Other ideas, other ways of looking at the world become more important to them than uh, than than the things that the Bible taught them. All of a sudden, whole new, you know, and before they know it, they turn around and realize. Now that realization may happen fast, uh, where they the, they didn't recognize they were drifting away. Uh, I remember um, my, my uh, mother-in-law talked about she, she used to go out, uh, you know, in the ocean and she would, uh, she would lay on a, on a raft and just be, you know, the sun was whatever. And she talked about one time she kind of, she must have fallen asleep and she sits up and she can barely see the beach. Like she was so far out and she, just, it, it just, she wasn't aware of it because everything that she was paying attention to stayed the same, the sun, the waves, you know, the birds, etc. But when she sat up, she realized that she was a long, long way from where she had been. And that happens to us in our spiritual lives. That happens to us 
in our relationship with Jesus, where one minute we think we're doing okay, but then little things start to slip. Little cracks make their way in. This happens in marriages too, where little cracks start to come in. Friendships, little cracks start to come in. And over a long time of not paying attention to it and over a long time of, of just not giving it the, uh, the attention that it deserves, all of a sudden we find the damage is done that, uh, that we don't even know if we can undo it. And that's, that's a pretty big deal, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of crazy, um, but that's what happens. And the author of the book of Hebrews is saying, hey, you need to be careful about this. You need to be careful that you don't drift away. You need to be careful that, uh, that, that, that you don't just lose your, your uh, footing uh, accidentally, that you don't like just you know, drift off little by little. Watch it because this is the most important thing. This is such an important reality. We have to be careful and we have to stay close and we have to recognize what we're doing because if we don't, we're going to be in really big trouble. I'm having a little bit of problems with, uh, with uh, my camera here. I'm not sure what's going on. Let me try and uh, reconnect with it. You should still be able to hear me fairly well, but, uh, but the camera itself is, seems to be sticking somehow. I hope that's better. Maybe not. Nope, it's still freezing. I'll try and find uh, a better way to uh, to work on the to to get. Maybe this will work better. Let's hope. It's not as nice a camera, but you know, maybe it'll work better. I don't know. I can't tell. Nope, doesn't seem to be working any better. <laughs> well, you can hear me. I hope. Um, please let me know in the comments on Facebook if you're having trouble hearing me. I'm sorry about that. That's weird. I, um, let's hope. Let's hope it gets fixed here soon. Okay, I don't know. Anyway, I don't, let's just get back to God's Word. And Satan, get out of my computer and out of my network in Jesus' name. Okay, so um, uh, where were we? Okay, the uh, yeah, we got to be careful about drifting away. We got to be careful about drifting away and dealing with uh, and dealing with uh, network issues as well. That's that can be a real issue. So we got to be careful about that. All right, so that's that's what he's saying. You got to be careful, and and we need to be careful. Guys, we've got to be careful. We have to pay attention to our Christian walk. We have to pay attention to our connection with Jesus. We have to pay attention to, the, to, to how connected we are with the Lord. That means everything. It's the only thing that means everything. It is the most important thing. You need to understand that life-destroying sins, they don't happen quick. There are a thousand little yeses before the big yes that steals us from the Lord. You know, adultery doesn't happen in a day. Adultery happens day after day after day, growing a little colder and a little colder and a little colder until saying yes to someone else is not that hard. You know, that's how it works. And that's how it works in our relationship with the Lord is that we get messed up in that way. It, it is we, we get pulled away from what the from what the Lord is is uh, uh, it's calling us to do, we get pulled away little by little. We forget who we are. We forget what God's done for us. We forget how much He loves us. We forget. We drift away. And he's saying, "Be careful not to drift away." One of the people that we think this book might be written to is a group of Jewish scholars who. Uh, 
had become Christians, but now we're kind of drifting back into Judaism, like away from Christianity and drifting back into Judaism. When we think, we think that might have been part of why this book was written, and this is one of the verses that makes us think that. Um, verses like this that make us think that these people had had accepted Christ, but now we're kind of thinking about had you know going back to just regular Judaism. The the drift is something we're all vulnerable to, and we need to be careful of it. It's it. I've seen it over and over again, and we need to be careful. And when somebody comes along and says to us, "Hey, God, hey, I'm a little worried about you. I kind of feel like you're drifting off." Don't be mad at them. They're just loving you, and maybe you should listen. Maybe you should hear that. Maybe it would be a good idea for you to say, to just do a heart check and say, am I drifting away? Is that true? Verse 2, for the word spoken through angels, for if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, and it was con confirmed to us by the word by those who heard, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. Okay, so what that means is um, the Old Testament law. If you know you could get killed, you know you could get stoned for disobeying the Old Testament law, right? They could take you to like a place and throw rocks at your head until you died. That's that's what stoning was, okay? Uh, let's let's not let's not pretend it was something less barbaric than that because it was that. And um and if if the Old Testament law, which was a lesser revelation than the than the revelation that comes through Jesus. If the Old Testament law was just in punishing those that forgot about it and that drifted away from it, how much more important is this? The author of the Hebrews is saying here, because of who Jesus is and the weightiness of Jesus' message, we have extra, we have to be extra careful not to fall away from this message. This isn't remember to brush your teeth. Okay, that's not what the, this isn't um, the blessing or cursing of the law of Moses. This comes directly from Jesus. God himself is the mediator of this covenant. And this gospel deserves our utmost attention. Okay, that's why Paul in Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Paul wasn't kidding around. Paul was saying, listen, guys, if you hear any other message, even if it's coming from us, if it's another message other than Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the one who forgives your sins, Jesus is the revelation of the, of, of the, of the Father, if it's any message other than that, then you need to shut that person down. And let me say this to you. I'm about to get a little political. Well, not political, I'm, but I'm gonna, might mess with some people's business. There, is, there, are, there are other gospels going around. Other gospels that try and point you not to the good news of a God who, of God becoming king, not to the good news of Jesus, our Messiah, but to the good news of of earthly prosperity, health, wealth, and prosperity, but to the good news of, of, uh, of uh, even a country that is great and awesome and, and whatever. Those are all false gospels. There is one gospel, and it's the gospel that tells you that Jesus is king, that Jesus has defeated the enemy on the cross, that he has taken care of your sin, and that now available to you is to step under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, receive forgiveness of sins, and be an agent of new creation, which we'll talk about as we move forward. That's the New Testament gospel. That's the gospel that Paul preached, and that's the gospel that the book of Hebrews is telling us not to drift away from. 
the revelation of God that came through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Paul says, let him be accursed. In fact, there's one place, and I think it's in Galatians, where Paul talks about these guys who've been going around telling people that they had to be circumcised in order to, uh, in order to be followers of Jesus, which Paul's like, no, you don't. Jesus took care of all of that stuff. Um, and Paul was like, I wish they'd go the whole way and just cut everything off, which, yikes. Okay, that's, that's yeah. Anyway, Paul wouldn't kid around. So, the truth about Jesus is just too important to mess around with. That's why we have to be vigilant to understand the message of Jesus and follow it with all our hearts. Can I say this loudly enough? I don't think I can. This is why we have to be vigilant to fully understand what is the gospel? What did Jesus accomplish on the cross? What are we called to do and, <laughs> and to follow it? Not just understand it, but then to live it out. We have been called to be disciples of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And if, it, we, if we accept anything less, then we have not heard and responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, would, I will say this without qualification. If we are not disciples of Jesus Christ, we are not saved. Period. I don't, I'm not afraid to say that because it's the truth. If you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying you have to have everything figured out. I'm not saying you have to be without sin for so many days, blah, blah, blah. No, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if you are not a follower of Jesus, pursuing him, following him, trying to emulate his, to, 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 to follow his example, if, if that's not who, if you're not doing that, you're not saved. You're not a Christian, period. I don't care what church you belong to. I don't care how many times you've been baptized. I don't care how many times you've taken communion. If you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are not saved. End of conversation. Now, we can talk later about people that start down the path toward Jesus and then end up off, on a di off in a ditch, etc. I believe in a God of incredible, unstoppable, never-ending grace. But the gospel doesn't work unless we're in 100%. Hear that. Okay. If you, if, huh. if you heard what I just said and you got a little scared, um, uh, that's okay. It's okay to be a little scared because this is a scary thing. Don't stay scared. Jesus is right here, right now. Ask him to lead you back to the path. It's not about perfection. It's not about getting it all right. It's not about having it all figured out. It's about saying yes over and over again. It's about, like Martin Luther said, all life is repentance. The minute that we find out, oh no, I've gotten off the path, get back on. Get back on. There is, the door is never closed. God's grace is always there. But don't walk away from God's grace and consider yourself a follower of Jesus because you're not. Okay. I had to, I had to go there. You know I did. All right. Um, he says, he says, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I was reading a commentary by a guy named David Guzik. I would definitely recommend him. Um, EnduringWord.org, I think, is his website. Great commentary. Um, uh, I agree with a lot of what he says. Maybe not everything. Uh, but, but anyway, and, and he pointed out that the word neglect there is the same word that Jesus uses in uh, the parable of the marriage supper, which is in Matthew, I think Matthew 22. Um, and if, I don't know if you remember this parable, but the parable is that the master, the king, he sets up this beautiful, uh, uh, like le this beautiful, like uh, uh, supper. You know, he kills the fatted calf, he prepares everything, and then he sends his servants out with the uh, with the invitation: come to the supper, come to the come, 
come and enjoy this party with me, you know, right? That's, that's his invitation. Come and enjoy this party here with me. Uh, it's going to be great. And everybody that the servants go to is like, you know, I kind of have some other things planned. Uh, you know, you know, maybe I'll show up. I don't know. You know, just, you know, and, and, and the king is, is not happy about that at all. And so then he sends people out. Well, this word that Jesus uses, this word neglect uh, in the book of Hebrews is the same word that Jesus uses when he talks about them. He says they made light of the invitation. They neglected the invitation. In other words, the invitation has gone out to you. You've even heard it. Maybe you even said you would come, but, a, but when the day came, you didn't show up. That's what he's talking about. And how many times have we done that? And if you remember back to our Song of Solomon study, that was the stuff that got the Shulamite woman in trouble over and over again, is that there was an invitation from the king and she decided not to go, <laughs> right? Okay, so that, that's the, uh, the uh, yeah, so uh, let's not neglect so great a salvation. The idea is they could have come, but they treated other things with higher priority. I see it all the time. People don't choose to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. People don't choose. They, they find other ways to use their time and their energy and their money, and they have no idea how foolish they're being. They're drifting away. I, I'm, there's a whole lot of sacred cows that I could bring out in front of you right now. Let's talk about kids and their sports teams. Let's talk about work and finding a job that doesn't keep you out of church. Let's talk about, I know I'm being harsh today, but I'm just trying to, to bring to you what the book of Hebrews says. And, and truly, I love you and I'm being a pastor to you right now. And I'm saying to you, if there are things in your life which get more of your time, more of your energy, and more of your money than your relationship with Jesus Christ. And this isn't about, pastor wants my money. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. Lord, we, that's not what this is about. The one way to know how high a priority is in someone's life is to look at their checkbook. In our day and age, the best way to figure out how much of a priority something is in someone's life is to look at their calendar. How much time do you spend? Have you spent time in God's Word this week? Have you spent time in prayer? Have you spent time with the Lord? It's a big deal. It's not a small thing. We as Western people, we've lost the sense of the holy. We've lost the sense of the sense of awe that the generations before us have had. We don't recognize the things that are important and the things that have worth and the things that are that deserve our time and our attention and our respect. We've forgotten. We've left them behind. We've left them behind. And it's not okay, and it's going to catch up with us. We're going to drift away. I just want to pray. Because <laughs> I've, I've been hammering now for a minute, and I want to pray before... We move on to this next part. Um, Holy Spirit, I'm right here, and I, I want to confess uh, right now in Jesus' name that I, I drift just like everyone else. Uh, I have the same kinds of issues that everybody else has, and I, I need to be pulled back. I need to be brought uh, back to 
every day back to the things that are important. So as, as we move on, I pray, Holy Spirit, that this message would be heard by me first and by anyone that's listening, that we would recognize and reassert the importance of our walk with Christ, our salvation. That it would have first place in our lives. That we would, Father, I ask you, give us the grace to obey the first and greatest commandment, which says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. That command, that that one of the Ten Commandments is said, we should have no other gods before you. Lord, you be number one in my life, I ask, for myself and for my friends, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, we've got a bunch of other stuff to cover, so let's move on. Okay, so... Then he kind of shifts gears, okay? He's talking about drifting away and the importance of the gospel message. And now he's going to shift gears and uh, in verse 5, um, which I didn't read to you. Let me read, let me read. And he's kind of going to go back a bit to the... Uh, to the... Uh, talking about the angels stuff okay so for he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking okay what it feels like a complete flip like what's going on okay wait a minute he's talking about this uh, about the message and the importance of the message and not to drift away from the message and then he goes back so he's actually going back to the, the stuff that was in chapter 1. And he's saying, For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject subject to him but now we do not yet see all things subject to him we're getting ahead of ourselves just a wee bit there but but okay so for he did not subject to angels the world to come now, that that's a little clumsy the way that the new american standard said that the idea is the the idea of this whole passage is number one um uh well, well no let me think that through a second okay so the idea of this whole passage is that uh because of what Jesus did, okay, humanity is going to be set on the throne of creation under Christ. Okay? And he's saying angels aren't going to be ruling the age to come. Now, why is that even important? First of all, I need to talk to you a bit about the age to come. Because this is an idea that, uh, that, that we don't... Uh, the church historically has not done a great job of 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 helping people understand this particular idea about about eschatology. Okay, that word means the study of last things, the study of end times, eschatology. Okay, and and uh, and there is a, a whole narrative about. What God is trying to do that I think is m largely missing from the church, I really try and talk about it a lot at Fremont Community, but if you're watching and you're not from Fremont Community, it's entirely possible you've never heard of what I'm about to talk to you about, okay? Even if, and maybe if you go to Fremont Community, you just don't listen very well, you may not have heard. <laughs> um, I love you. Uh, but, uh, but the world to come okay, is uh, this, Jesus is referring, this is what Jesus was referring to when he talks about the kingdom of God, and this is what Jesus is, means, and th this is what it means in other places when he talks about the last days or the age to come. It's all surrounding this idea that existed kind of in the world of Second Temple Judaism. Oof, 
there's a whole lot to talk about there, okay? Jesus lived during the time of the second Jewish temple, um, the temple built by Herod the Great. And there was a whole lot of conversation and literature that was being written and read and talked about. There was a lot of scholarship going on during that time. And thankfully, we have a lot of that. And their ideas about how to interpret Scripture and their ideas about what God was trying to do and their ideas about a lot of things um, are very different than, than some of our current ideas. But the Bible was written to people who lived in that time and people who were familiar with, especially this book, people who were familiar with the thought processes and the, and the uh, worldview of Second Temple Jewish scholars. And so we need to be, I'm, tr I'm trying not to use big words, we need to be aware of some of those ideas from that time. And if we aren't, the New Testament is not going to make much sense to us. Um, also, some of those ideas are correct. And, and those, I mean, like theologically correct. Uh, and we can't understand without the, uh, the New Testament without them. And this idea of the last days that we're in and the age to come that he's talking about, okay, and the kingdom of God, these ideas are incredibly important. They're the central theme of Jesus' ministry and preaching. <laughs> this is such a big deal. It's not a small thing. It's a massive thing. And many of our misinterpretations of the gospel have come directly from our misunderstanding of this idea. Okay, so here's the idea. In Second Temple Judaism, okay, there was an idea. They, they believed that God had created the world, obviously, we still believe that, and that uh, sin had broken the world. We still believe that, right? Um, and they believed that in the end, that God had a plan, that in the end, he was going to fix the whole world. And the way he was going to fix the whole world was by sending Messiah to be God, become king in the world, okay? That's what the age to come looks like. Part of God becoming king in the world is that even death itself would be undone. They believed, some of them, the Pharisees particularly, believed that God was going to raise at least the righteous, maybe everybody. We found out later that everyone is every, that it is everybody, although I don't know that you're going to want to be raised from the dead if you're name isn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life because it doesn't really make things better for you, but that's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go that far yet in talking about this idea. Um, but that there would be this event called the resurrection where the righteous would be raised from the dead and that they would partake in the age to come along with the people that are alive at the time when the age to come actually happens. Uh, I hope I haven't lost everybody in that. Um, in that, uh, so when the the author of the Hebrew says God did God did not subject to angels the world to come, what he is talking about is that God's plan is that after uh, this age, the age that they are living in, comes to an end that there will be a day when humanity will rule with Christ over all of creation in what we call the age to come. Okay? We believe that. The church believes that. That the, the saints will rule with Christ. Not just through the, during the millennial period, but after. I'm, I'm trying... I'm a big eschatology nerd, and so I'm trying not to fill in too many details. But here's the idea human beings will be the ones to rule in the age to come, not angels. Now, what does that have to do with Jesus being greater than the law and greater than angels? It is because Jesus became a man 
that men and women will be the rulers of the age to come. It's because Jesus became human that we will be restored to the vocation God gave us from the beginning. Remember, vocation means job, what we do, how we do, how we live our lives. The human vocation has been rulership from the beginning. This is what we were created to do. So what, why is he mentioning this now? I'm telling, let me tell you why. He's mentioning this now because if you are destined to rule alongside Christ, then everything that leads up to that moment and all of the ways that we are involved with it now is about preparing us for our time of rulership. Now, um, because God's kingdom, and this is what Jesus was preaching about every day, this is what the Sermon of the Mount is all about, this is what Jesus' moral teachings are all about, it's all about what does it look like when God becomes king? What does it look like when God becomes king. That's what the kingdom of heaven is about. That's what Jesus is talking about. What does it look like when God becomes king? And that is the content of the message that we have to pay attention to. And that is the res the revelation that Jesus brought of what it looks like when God the Father becomes king, when Jesus becomes king, when the Holy Spirit becomes king. And if we haven't fully understood and stepped into that reality, we cannot be a part of the rulership we've been created to be a part of. Now, I want to talk for a minute about some of the contents of that, of what it means when God becomes king. What does it mean? What does it look like? What does God's kingdom look like? Well, that's what Jesus' parables were all about. That's what the Sermon on the Mount was about. God's kingdom doesn't work like man's kingdom. That's why Jesus said to Pontius Pilate, uh, if my kingdom were a worldly kingdom, my people would fight for me to be released. Do you remember that? Jesus standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the epitome of man's kingdom, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire is looking at him going, you're a king. If you were a king, why aren't they busting you out? And he looks at them and says, because my kingdom is not like your kingdom. My, king does, my kingdom doesn't work the way your kingdom does. My kingdom works completely differently. And Jesus talked about it this way when James and John came along and they were like, and they were like, we want to sit at your right hand and your left hand in, in your kingdom. And, and in one of the stories, it's their mama, you know, that comes and says to them and says to Jesus, uh, it says to Jesus, hey, I want my boys seated next to you. And Jesus is like, you don't know what you're asking. Um, Jesus says, listen, the way earthly kingdoms work is that people who have power, mostly the power of the sword, the power of violence, the power of death, lord that power over those who don't. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, it must not be that way among you. No, the kingdom of heaven he that is the servant of all is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is backwards from the way the kingdom of earth works. Instead of threat, the kingdom of heaven uses love, uses servanthood, uses self-sacrifice. Instead of do what I tell you to or else, the kingdom of heaven says, you're invited to a banquet. I love N.T. Wright. It's one of my all-time favorite theologians, probably the foremost New Testament theologian in the world right now. And the way he says it is this. He says, when God wants to sort out the world, he doesn't send in the tanks. <laughs> he sends in the meek and the broken, those that are hungry for justice, the peacemakers, the pure in heart. 
When God wants to sort out the world, he doesn't do it with a bomb or a gun. He does it through self-sacrificing love. And that is who Jesus is, and that is what Jesus did. When Jesus wanted to fix what was wrong with the world, he came, and he suffered, and he died, and he rose again. And that's how he fixed what was wrong with the world. Jesus didn't raise an army and march over the nations and become Jesus the Great. Jesus didn't, we don't have statues of Jesus on a horse with a sword held high. Jesus didn't come as a warrior king. Jesus came as a foot-washing prophet. And Jesus says, this is what kingdom authority looks like. Servanthood, selflessness, sacrifice. That's what it looks like. We have to stay close to that message. We have to stay close to that reality. We have to live in that world. That's the world that we belong in. And in the age to come, when humanity rules with Christ, that is what it will look like. I love to say it like this. I love to say that this is, that is the day when love will be the law of the land. That is, that's, that's the end goal here. That's God's end game. We could talk all day long. <laughs> I have a huge problem. Okay. Spoiler alert right now. If you have not seen the movie Avengers Endgame, then you need to skip over the next like five minutes of this talk. Okay. Because I'm going to tell you what happens in the end. I know I probably shouldn't do this, but I feel like I need to. Because a lot of you probably saw that movie. If you care at all about that movie and you haven't seen it, okay, then just stop watching now. That's the best. Okay. All right. Just skip for like five minutes ahead and you'll be good. So what happens at the end of that movie, boy, it's a lot to explain, but there was this big bad guy and he killed half the universe, he killed half the people in the universe. And they were trying to bring those people back and they were trying to defeat the bad guy obviously they were successful in bringing the people back but in the battle to defeat the final battle to defeat the bad guy the end of that battle was that iron man kind of the leader of the the leader of the uh of the group iron man takes up the weapon of the enemy and he does what the enemy did. The enemy killed half the universe just by snapping his finger. Iron Man kills the enemy, the big bad guy, and all of his armies by snapping his finger. Most people saw that movie and cheered. Yay! Way to go! He killed the bad guy! Woo! Now he did end up dying in the process. So in that way, it was self-sacrificial. But I was so deeply dissatisfied with that ending, and let me tell you why. I was deeply dissatisfied with that ending because so now the good guy's answer to what's wrong with the world is the same as the bad guy's answer to what's wrong with the world. Is that how this works? Is it just being a better killer? A person that only kills bad people? Is that how the world works? Is, is, is that what it means to be good? I'm not okay with that. And the reason I'm not okay with that is because that's not what Jesus did. I have most of my life subscribed to an eschatology that says that there will be a day when Jesus will do exactly that. And I'm having a really hard time with that right now but we're not going to go there I'm not okay with I'm not okay with the end of all things and the end game of God's great plan being the world is still ruled by death
I'm not okay with that. And I'm not okay with death being an answer for anything ever. The kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, is a different kind of kingdom. And it will be men, it will be men who rule it, men formed into the image of Christ. Verse 6, one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him or the son of man that you're concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. That's Psalm 8, chapter 4 through 6, or verse 4 through 6. It is humanity in Christ that will rule in the age to come. And the story of Christ is the story of all mankind for a while. You know, God created us in Genesis 1, or I think we were created in, for, in chapter 3. doesn't matter. Anyway, let us make man in our image. Why? So that he may rule over the birds, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, etc. That's what we were created to do. We were created to rule. And if we drift away from the story, from the message, from Jesus' revelation of the Father then we won't know what rulership looks like. We won't know what it looks like when God becomes king. We're going to just try and do rulership in a human way better than we did before, but that's not who we are and that's not what we're destined for. We're destined to rule like Christ. We're destined to rule out of love and self-sacrifice and servanthood. That's what we're destined to do. And you are currently, by the power of the gospel and by the power of the Holy Spirit and by a study of God's word, you are right now being transformed into the image of Christ so that when the day comes, God can hand you a crown without fear. Because that's what God is trying to do. Romans 8, 28 and 29. I'm going to read to one of your favorite verses and then I'm going to ruin it. It's one of my favorite things to do. I'm not actually ruining it. I'm just fully explaining it because this is what you were created to do. And this is why Jesus died for you. And this is the point of the gospel. And this is why we should not drift away from this message. Because we were created to be formed into the image of the Son. That's who we are. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. What a great verse. God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But I have two questions coming out of that verse. One, what does it mean? What is the good that he's talking about? What is the good that he's working towards? And if you don't know that, then you don't know what this verse means. Thankfully, verse 29 tells us the good that God's working for and the purpose that we're called according to. For those God knew, foreknew, he also predestined to become, to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. What is the good that God is working all things toward? The good is your being conformed into the image of the Son. That's the good. So you may look at things in your life and you may say, how in the world is God working this to my good? Well, let me help you. Because when God, when it says that, it's not your good doesn't mean that your bank account's going to be full. It doesn't mean that you're going to get that promotion at work. It doesn't mean that you're never going to get sick. It doesn't mean that you might not get sick all the way to the point of death. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go through difficult things. What it means is that all of these points of suffering, all of these difficult things, that God will use all of them to form you into the image of the Son. You see, God doesn't prevent us from experiencing pain. God gives our pain a purpose. God glorifies our scars just like Jesus' scars are glorified. We worship a scarred God, a broken God, a, a God who hurt. And he will bring healing and he will bring restoration. 
And I'm not saying God never delivers. And I'm not saying God never heals. And I'm not saying God never. But what I am saying is that's not what's promised in this verse. What's promised in this verse is that none of it goes to waste. Why? Because your eternal destiny is far more important. Which, by the way, it goes on to say that later. For the sufferings of this present age are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. It isn't that you're not going to suffer. It's that your suffering is glorified with purpose. God's purpose to transform you into the image of Christ. Because you were made to rule. And the day is coming when you will receive a crown to rule alongside Christ. And the size of your assignment in the age to come is based completely on how much like Jesus you look when you're standing before his throne. This is the good God's working for, and this is the purpose to which you were called. Christ-likeness, the fruit of the Spirit. Dallas Willard is a wonderful teacher. He says, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I love that line. And God's intent for each of us is that we should become the kind of person whom he could empower to do whatever we want. Ever seen Bruce Almighty? Here's this kind of dumb dude, and he gets all the powers of God, and he wrecks everything, right? What Jesus is after is a person, a group of people, a family that he can pour, give all of his authority and power to with no fear whatsoever about what they would do with it. Why? Because they've been conformed into the image of his son. They've been made just like Jesus. So he knows what they will do with his power. Because they're going to do the same thing with his power that he would do. That's the God we serve. A God who calls us into maturity. A God who calls us into authority. And a God who is ready to give us responsibility. If we are formed in the image of his son is why we can't drift away because this is our eternal destiny we're talking about you were born to reign with christ but the level of your authority is dependent entirely upon how much like jesus you've become and that's not just in the age to come that's well, because the truth is the age to come has already begun. Verse 8. You have, past tense, put all things in subjection under his feet, Jesus' feet. God has already done it. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But we do not yet see all things subject to him. So Jesus is in charge of everything. Oh, but it doesn't, but boy, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, that's true. It doesn't. It doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it at all. There's still a lot of death, still a lot of trouble, still a lot of sin, still a lot of horrible things going on. And you're telling me Jesus is in charge of all this? Jesus isn't doing a very good job. Well, that's because we are living in the tension of the now and the not yet. Jesus' kingdom and his rulership have been inaugurated. They've begun. But they are not yet in full manifestation. 
Why? Have you ever wondered why God isn't more obvious? Have you ever wondered why God doesn't just show up all the time? Why God doesn't, you know, I've always wondered, like, I, I know that I, I think, um, you know, if, if, I was, if I was preaching a gospel message and all of a sudden I just, like, got, you know, picked up off the floor and began to, like, hover across the auditorium with, you know, glory shining from me, I, I think, I think we could grow the church. I think. Have you ever wondered why God isn't obvious like that? I know we're out of time. But God has put us in this place of tension for a reason, and I don't want to leave until we've talked about that. God has put us in this place of tension because God hides so that we can hide from Him. If God were so obvious so completely manifest that it was undeniable at all times how powerful and present he is. There'd be a whole lot of people that served him just because of fear and not because of love. And what God wants are lovers who serve him because they love him. That's his desire. And if he's everywhere, shining out there, gaudy and gorgeous, it wouldn't take faith. And there is a beautiful thing about people who serve a God that they cannot see. Jesus said it to Thomas. He said, blessed are you because you saw and believed, but blessed, even more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. There's something about a people who say, I don't have it all figured out. I don't understand. But my answer, Jesus, is still yes. God hides so that if we choose to, we can hide from him. We live in the tension of the now and the not yet. Jesus is already king. But we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Why? Because God's waiting for people to make their own choice. Am I going to believe? Am I going to follow? Am I going to be his? Let's pray. Father, wow, we've gone over a lot. I just pray that some nugget, some little thing has come from your spirit. And put itself in our hearts. And Lord, I just pray that you would enable us to stay close to the fire. Not to drift away from this message. To recognize how important it is. To allow your spirit to transform us into the image of Jesus. Because we've been created for more than this. We've been built for rulership. Lord, I pray that we would see it, that we would lay hold of it, and that we would begin, even now, to be agents of new creation, agents of the kingdom of heaven, that the, the authority of God would flow through us as we walk in the way of the cross. I ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen and amen. I'll see you next week. God bless you. I love you.